our focus today will be on the literature review and on paragraph structuring. So to begin with, a key question for us is then, what is the primary aim of the literature review? And as MND students, this is quite important for you because the whole literature review is sort of a comprehensive summary of previous research on a topic and the review surveys scholarly articles, books and other sources relevant to a particular area of research. So the review should enumerate, describe, summarize and critically and objectively evaluate and clarify this previous body of research before you can actually do your own research because this is quite important to show where your research fits into the current body of research that is out there already. <clears throat> Thank you, Hawa. Next slide. So when you write a thesis, a proposal, a, or even a research paper, you will have to conduct a literature review to situate your research within this existing body of knowledge. It provides an overview of current knowledge, allowing you to identify relevant theories, methods, gaps in the existing research or body of literature. So you need to show, we will repeat this many times because a lot of the students fail to show how their research fits into the existing body of knowledge or how their research contributes to that body of knowledge or what is the gap that your research is trying to address. Is your research new research or is it exactly what other people are doing already? Is this knowledge already out there and how do you then build on that knowledge that is out there? So your literature review demonstrates your knowledge of a particular field of research and you have to ask yourself what is already known about the topic that you are looking at. Um, just to add also, it's important for you to note that um, the literature review, obviously as Naima was saying, uh, shows the gaps and, and the importance of your study, but it also builds on your rationale. So always think about as you're writing your literature review, keep that rationale um, in mind or, or paste it up in front of you so that you're always constantly seeing it and seeing whether your literature review is unpacking what you are saying in, in your rationale. Yeah, absolutely. So, so you need to ask yourself also, why is your research still necessary? Your research needs to clearly show how you address a, the gap or contribute to existing debates. It also has to show how your work fits in with what has already been done by others. So it provides a detailed context for your current study that you are em embarking on. It will demonstrate that your work has significance. It is important you are trying to prove something or demonstrate something or even um, you, some study that was done in a different country, you want to show that it also holds true within the context of South Africa. That is also new knowledge because it's a different population, a different context, etc. So it shows that your work will lead to new knowledge. It also clearly shows a theoretical foundation for the work you propose to do. How did others theorize about this work? How did they make sense of this work? What are the, what are the implications of, of the work? So the literature review then gives you a chance to demonstrate your familiarity with the topic and scholarly context, develop a theoretical framework, and methodological framework for your research. It positions your research in relation to other research that is out there already. It shows how your research addresses a gap or contributes to a particular debate. Next slide, please, Hoa. <clears throat> so how would one then separate a good literature review from a poor review of existing literature? Well, a good literature review will order articles and books to focus on unresolved debates, inconsistencies, tensions, and questions that are in the research field that you are focusing on. It explains the historical background of a topic. So in other words, it will look at seminal work. Who were the first people to write about this topic? Who came up with a particular concept or theory? And then you build on those kind of, of background. 
It will highlight the gaps in the existing research. It will describe and compare the schools of thought on an issue. What did the, this the, like behaviorists say? What did um, social constructivists say? What did critical theorists say about a particular topic, etc.? It will highlight and critique research methods and it will synthesize past and current research on the topic and show how your research fits in the existing body of research. So this is a very important point. Your literature review has to have current knowledge, mostly current knowledge in it, because it will show where the existing gaps are. But it, even though you will have to speak to seminal works on a particular area or topic, the current knowledge are the most important because what if other researchers currently have already addressed your topic and have already given the answers to what you are trying to find? So you need to make sure that you are your literature review is as comprehensive and concise as possible. So you must note areas of dis disagreement, highlight and critique research, justify the topic you plan to investigate and convince the reader because at the end of the day, the person who reads your thesis, your supervisor, the examiner, you have to convince that reader that your research will address some important limitation or deficiency in, ex in the existing body of knowledge. So besides providing a backdrop to your study, the literature review then also provides a baseline against which you compare your own findings within your study. So in your discussion section, whatever you found, you will refer to existing literature and show how it, it proves or disproves or agrees or disagrees or add to existing literature. So that you always, your, so your literature review is an extremely important part of your thesis because it will substantiate your findings at the end of your research. Next slide, please, Howell. <clears throat> Emma, can I also just come in here and say um, okay. we're going to be referring to this uh, quite often, but we speak about the golden thread. So the golden thread is what holds the whole thesis together. So you don't want bits and pieces where um, they're not speaking to one another. So always, like I said, keep your rationale um, at hand where you can see why you're justifying the study so that your literature review speaks to that. Also keep up your, your title. It's very important because sometimes when you're doing literature searches, you tend to go on a tangent because you think these... Um, studies sound interesting and so you start reading up but it's got nothing maybe to do with your focus so so keep your focus always close at hand keep your title there keep your rationale there so that when you're busy uh, searching for this literature that you always refer back and and note that it's in line with with what you've um, envisioned to to study or to explore so how do you begin First of all, before you start searching for your literature, ensure that you have a, a, a clearly defined topic. Like how I've indicated, your research topic, your um, title of your thesis will tell you what your research topic is. Your title of your thesis is where your aim comes from. Your title of your thesis is where your objectives come from because your title, your aims, your objectives and your research questions are all interlinked with one another. So you need to ensure that you have a clearly defined topic. Your title is thus very important and indicate the boundaries of your literature review. You have to say, what are you looking at specifically? Outline what you will be covering in your literature review. So you create a broad outline for your literature review based on your title of your research and your aims and objectives. Note that a good title will guide your literature review. Writing a literature review involves finding relevant publications such as books and journal articles, critically analyzing these, explaining what you found. So Basically, there are five key steps. You search for relevant literature, you evaluate the sources, you identify themes, debates and gaps, you outline your structure and you write your literature review. And all of this to write your literature review, you will use what we call a funnel approach. So we're going to go through each one of these steps and tell you how to do these. And we will tell you first what the funnel approach is. So be in mind that a good literature review doesn't just summarize sources, it analyzes, synthesizes, synthesizes bringing all the things together, almost like infusing it, you're synthesizing it, and you 
critically evaluate to provide a clear picture of the state of knowledge on the subject. So in, in order for you to critically evaluate existing literature, you need to show your voice in that literature. You, you can't, you, you, you have to use obviously citations of what people have said, but your voice must come in of how do you make sense of what other people have said? What does it mean for you? And that's where, you, where your voice comes in when you summarize what other, people's have, other people have said in the literature review. Next slide, please, Hawa. <clears throat> Now, if I can also just come in here to say that your literature review is just not a regurgitation of, of what you've read and put down there. Your literature review actually shows the reviewer how you are uh, conceptualizing and, and reading this, critically reading these, these articles and, and formulating your study. And so your voice needs to come through and how you are critiquing or evaluating these studies and writing it up is important in the literature review. So, so always be mindful that a literature review is not just taking and saying, uh, study A said that, uh, for example, um, if we're looking maybe at depression, they that um, students felt depressed because um, of the COVID situation, for example. So, so it's important that you engage, and it's important that you critique and and show the gaps, show where you agree, show where you disagree, show where your study comes in. It's very important that you engage um, in in the in the literature review. And so what exactly is the funnel approach, right? The funnel approach is a, is, a, is, a, is a method of structuring a literature review, and it is designed to make sure that all the objectives of the literature review are met automatically. So if you apply properly your citations and originality, as well as the theory-based context and significance of your work will emerge. You start your review from the general to the specific. So, for example, if I want to look at violence, um, the extent and distribution of intimate partner violence um, and, and the risks fa risk factors that contribute um, to intimate partner violence. Um, so when I start my literature review, I can't just go and speak about intimate partner violence straight away. I have to take, if I use a funnel approach, I will go from the broad, I will look at violence it broadly. What is what is the extent of violence? What is like I would I would start out by saying it's a public health um, challenge within a global perspective and um, uh, this is happening at the global perspective. And then I will come down to say uh, within South Africa, violence is also a problem. It's also a public health challenge, but intimate partner violence in particular is a major problem. And I will expand on each one of those ideas within my literature review um, from the top to the bottom. So my background is where more, it has more to do with my topic area than with my actual research question. So my research question is, um, what are the, the, the contributory factors, the risks, um, the outcomes of intimate partner violence, etc. So my literature review would then start more of the, by the background, the broad scope of violence, the broad scope then of intimate partner violence and the extent and distribution of intimate partner violence. But what I actually want to know is what are the risk factors for intimate partner violence? So I will bold on that and go then to intimate partner violence, which is the core of what my study is about. So you 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 first look at distant related wor um, um, work to your topic. The closer to what you're doing, but it's not directly matched. It is in the middle of your 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 introduction, for example, to your proposal where you do a background, right? or where you do your literature review. Your narrow categories, you may deal with sources in more detail. And then the research that is particularly pertinent to your work is where you focus on you, the categories close to your research. And you may find you are looking at a few key papers in detail that describes your work in detail. There might not be a lot of work on that out there. So, for example, um, uh, one of my students looked at intimate partner violence from the male perspective, and, and there's very few literature that looks at intimate partner violence perpetrated by women. 
So, um, so, so, so he would have. He spoke um, more about the broad area than about what uh, um, studies found in terms of that. And 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 historically, um, there the is the, a, 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 um, a link that shows that it has been a problem over centuries already, but it's been relegated to the side because it's not as pronounced as IP intimate partner violence perpetrated against against women, and which is more harsher and more um, um, publicly open, and uh, it's um, a, a huger issue than intimate partner violence perpetrated against men. Um, so, so you see how you work from the broad and then you gradually become more narrow, just like a funnel, which is a wide opening that narrows to a small spout. So in a way, the information is funneled to your actual thesis statement or your research question or your primary aim of your topic. OK, so now we're going to, to go through the different steps. So step one is to collect scholarly information and resources. So how do we begin doing that? So so you you make a list of keywords. So for example, if I have a research question, what is the impact of social media on body image among Generation Z? Um, OK, so when uh, OK, there she is. So if my Apologies. research question is <clears throat> What is the impact of social media on body image among Generation Z? So if I create a list of keywords related to my research question, I would, for example, look at social media synonyms for social media. I would use Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Snapchat, TikTok, and whatever new things are out there. And then body image, I would have um, self-perception, self-esteem, mental health. And then for Generation Z, I would use teenagers, adolescents, youth, etc. So then you search for relevant sources. So you use your keywords to begin searching for sources. So your university library's catalog is a good place to start. Google Scholar, JSTOR, EBSCO Host, Project Muse. So those are web um, sites for humanities and social sciences. And then there for the life sciences and biomedicine, there's the midline. And for economics, you have econ lit. And then for physics, engineering and computer science, there's inspect. So what you will do is UNISA library also offers um, offers the service to um, to help you uh, with your literature searches as, as students um, embarking on the PhDs and masters. So you can contact the UNISA librarian for assistance in, in, in helping you with your literature review, or they can do maybe, um, there will probably be a library workshop on how you can navigate as a student um, the webs, the different websites or the different search engines where you can get articles or do your literature review. So what we do is also we use Boolean operators. So Boolean operators is really um, maybe working. Yeah, so you'll use like a capital A and D to find sources that contain more than one keyword. So for example, if I want to find sources that contain social media, body image, Generation Z, I would put and in capitals in my search, like at the top when you go to Google and you type in, for example, um, social media, then you type in a capital and so it will give you all information. If you go into Google Scholar all articles that's linked to that particular um, um, topic or, or, or with um, different kinds of social media, um, etc. And the link between social media, body image and Generation Z. So you can also use or to find sources that contain one of a range of synonyms, for example, Generation Z or teenagers or adolescents. So you can see there's a different um, synonyms and the first one is a link between the different aspects of your key search. And then also if you don't want something um, to come up, for example, if you want to find out about um, the amount of, of, of teenagers that use Apple products, uh, Apple iPhones or Apple laptops, etc. Then you will have to put in not when you search because otherwise you're going to get Apple the fruit or something else or Apple pie or something. Um, so you you use a Boolean search not. So you can see Boolean operators is A and D, O R and N O T. So the librarian will show you there's lots of other Boolean operators that you can also use, but the librarians will show you how to use them. <clears throat> Then the next step is to read the abstract to find out whether an article is relevant to your question, because sometimes you'll find these 
hundreds and hundreds of articles that you that comes up when you do your search. So you can't possibly read every single article unless you are doing a systematic review. But even when you are doing a systematic review or a scoping review, you will first look at the abstract of all the papers that you get. Look, the abstract will tell you what the aim is of the study, what the um, method is that the study used, um, who the um, the, the, the population was and the sample, what the uh, um, methods were and what the results were. So you will be able to see if it is relevant to your study. And if you are unsure, then you mark unsure and you will read the entire article to make sure that it is applicable or not applicable to your study. But you'll find these like um, when you do searches, you'll get articles that there's maybe just a word in um, maybe Facebook or Instagram or whatever and or social media, but it has nothing to do with your aim of your study. So then you will discard those articles. Thank you. Have a next slide. <clears throat> so what is important is to analyze the network of information and select the works or the material that are most useful to you. So keep reading, reading and more reading. Make time for this activity. Keep references, database and notes in a systematic way. Believe me, as a student, I will advise you have a hardcover notebook next to you. If a paper or an article is relevant to you, make a note of it and write down the reference of that article. Believe me, most students at the end of their thesis, when they're almost done, they have references that are missing and then they can't find it. And it is a nightmare to find those references. But if you keep your references in a systematic way, you can always go back. And if you keep your material and you summarize, Kawa will tell you a little bit further about this. If, but if you keep that material and you make those notes, you'll be able to go back to it and you won't lose it. And then you use mind maps and charts to identify intersections of research and outline important categories. So uh, we will go through that also. So you probably won't be able to read absolutely everything that has been written on the topic. You will have to evaluate which sources are most relevant to your questions. So when searching for articles, ask yourself some key questions. Next slide, please, Hoa. What questions or problems is the author addressing? What are the key concepts and how are they defined? What are the key theories, models and methods? Does the research use established frameworks or take an innovative approach? What are the results and conclusions of the study? How does the publication relate to other literature in the field? Does it confirm, add to or challenge established knowledge. Believe me, that's a very important point. If you want to write a critical literature review and you find some articles disagreeing with one another, some researchers, you'll have to point that out. You'll have a paragraph um, pointing out that this is what um, Ismail and Talib found. However, um, Makania and Bata disagree with what they found because they indicated or found this with a sample of this in. You must always point out where the study was done because that is important. The context, the context, the context is, is extremely important to show with what population the study was done because we know in South Africa, we have a deep and dark history globally, not just in South Africa, of how research was done on people who are different from 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 the researcher to show that um, negative issues within that particular population. So it's important. It's extremely important to point out the population and why a particular study findings showed that because we are all aware of the study that was done at Stellenbosch University where the researchers showed who that colored women are not as intelligent as other populations. It was a huge furor and uproar for us in the Western Cape who come from a colored background. And, and we know these are things that happen. So it's important to critically evaluate research that you get. And, and for us as scholars, our critical, criticality is where we actually 
add to existing literature? How does the publication contribute to your understanding of the topic is another question. What are its key insights and arguments? What are the strengths and weaknesses of the research? So after you have evaluated the sources which are most relevant to your questions, you then take notes and cite your research res, um, sources, um, the, your um, actual uh, sources. It is important to keep track of your sources with citations to avoid plagiarism. So as you read, you should also begin the writing process. Take note, what have you learned from this article? It is important to keep track of your sources, like I said, and you can use there are free citation um, generators such as APA citations, ML, MLI citations, and then also the scribber plagiarism checker that students can use to ensure that they, they stay, um, their work is original and they don't plagiarize um, the work. Um, the next slide, please, Howell. But and I can also just come in here. As students, you need to be also aware. Read the um, the emails that come through via your UNISA My Life uh, email address. Check all the sources sent to you because there's a lot of um, information where UNISA provides support. So UNISA will have, for example, like the turn it in um, option. So you can send in your chapters, whether it's drafts, whether it's certain sections, you can send that in, whether it's your proposal, whether it's your thesis itself, to have those checked for um, plagiarism or, or have them check it to see the um, what do they call it, Naima? They don't call it plagiarism. Similarity index. Uh, similarity index. Yeah, so, yeah. so use these resources. Like Naima was saying also, use the library um, for for uh, a literature search. Use all the, the resources available um, as students. Use these so that you can gain maximum benefit and then also have a good product at, at the end. Yeah. So, yeah. I, like just to reiterate, you must remember that UNISA offers a wealth of information and opportunities for 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 learning and 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 um, classes and workshops. So you, if you stay up to date with what the university offers, it will help you in your process. You must remember UNISA has a history of being one of the very few online universities globally that has has a has a good. Um, um, a track record in terms of an experience because we saw this during COVID when all other universities were falling over their feet to go online and they struggled. But we, this is what you need to do best. So when there's an opportunity for workshops, go and join these workshops and you can learn from it and it will just help you in your PhD journey or your master's journey. Um, Dr. Ismail and I both did our PhDs through UNISA. We did our undergrad through, through UNISA as well and, and we've really benefited quite well from this journey with UNISA. So use, use the resources that UNISA offer. OK, coming back to just our sorry, next. Dr. Talib, can I just come in here again? <laughs> just to say that um, just because we online and distance learning does not mean you need to. OK, there as a need... student, you need to be proactive. Yeah. So, so, so you have, it's, it's important that, for example, um, when you may be still struggling with your um, concept notes or maybe you're busy with your proposal, it's important to join uh, for certain classes or certain training sessions that's being uh, provided to help you also discern what would be best suited for your study. Because what we also see is lots of students, they write up, for example, the methodology section and they and they confuse because they're not sure what the difference is between qualitative, what's the difference between quantitative. They're also not sure which would best suit the um, study or, or the um, aims and objectives. So it's important to be proactive. Look at the um, the courses or the training sessions being provided for the month of, for, for example, of May or for June and see which ones uh, are important for your study or which ones would help you um, approach your study better or inform you um, in making decisions about what you're writing about. So, so be proactive. Also, um, see, look for other students maybe that's in the same department that's doing similar studies and then form a study group because sometimes that support is also useful where you can bounce off ideas from one another, discuss, describe, 
things and, and it just gives you better understanding. And the more you talk about your study, uh, the more you unpack um, in your mind, for example, and when you're writing, it becomes clearer. And, and then you more, the more you see, for example, the pitfalls and the gaps and, and what needs to be attended to. Sorry, Dr. Dalit. <laughs> no, it's OK, your team. <laughs> So, so the next step is to describe and summarize each of the articles that you've selected. You determine two or three important concepts or findings discussed in each of the texts and take note of important aspects. Next slide, please, Hawa. OK, so to begin organizing your literature reviews argument and structure, you need to understand the connections and relationships between the sources you've read. Based on your reading and notes, you can look for trends and patterns, whether there's a trend in theory or method or results. Say, for example, most studies that looked at intimate partner violence used a behaviorist approach, for example, and then you give who, then you put your references of which studies did that, like um, you put it in your, in brackets, your, in your uh, referencing. And then you say, however, um, so-and-so or Ismail and Talib and Makanya and Bata, they looked at intimate partner violence from a masculinity perspective or a, a gendered perspective using critical theory. So, so that is how you show trends and patterns in terms of theory. So, and then in terms of method, most studies that you see, they used quantitative approaches where they used surveys to collect data or questionnaires to collect the data. However, um, Ismail and Talib and Makanya and Mabata used a qualitative approach where they did interviews and focus groups. Or there's other qualitative approaches that people use like um, photo documentaries, asset mapping, um, visual um, um, kind of data collection methods. There's different types of methods that people use. And then you, you ask yourself, do certain approaches become more or less popular over time or although in 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 par, in the past most studies looked um at the the, the um at the the concept of ipv or intimate partner violence using a quantitative approach current trends in the literature shows that most researchers uses a qualitative approach to get a more in-depth understanding of how women perceive their experiences within this area so then after that, you, you look at the themes, what questions or concepts are repeated across the literature, right? And then what are the debates, the conflicts and contradictions? Where do sources disagree? What are the key publications? Are there any influential theories or studies that change the direction in the field? So what is missing from the literature? What are the gaps? This tip will help you work out the structure of your literature review and if applicable, show how your own research will contribute to existing knowledge. For example, I like trends or gaps, etc. So in our example that I highlighted earlier in reviewing the literature on social media and body image, maybe I would make a note that in my book, remember you're going to have a hardcover book. Most research has focused on young women but they didn't focus on young males and social media and body image. There is an increasing interest in the visual aspect of social media in like your TikTok videos. However, um, the, in the past, the focus was more on actual, um, um, what is that other one? Uh, Instagram, not Instagram, where, where they only typed words out of whatever so you can you guys the younger generation knows us better than what we do however there's still a lack of robust research on highly visual platforms like instagram and snapchat this is a gap that you could address in your own research and because this is what you then found because most of 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 the of the um of the social media was done in in the the format that are, uses uses words like your um I can't get to the words now. What is that uh, um, app um, that we always use? Oh, not Instagram. Uh, Twitter? 
going to be taking over certain sections and, and we're so happy to be here and I think it's important as you as we're going through the uh, PowerPoint, make notes, see where you have questions on your own study and then don't forget to post it uh, in the chat. Also, Dr. Talib is from Old School, so she speaks about having a hardcover. Um, there's many apps I use, um, Notes, the Notes app on my phone, so I make lots of notes on there. I have files that are um, color coded um, on my laptop, so whatever is important for you or what suits you best is, is what, you, what you should be doing. So I'm just going to be turning off my camera and then continuing on. Oh, and just to say, Welcome, uh, Prof. Um, I see you've joined as well. So, uh, step four is to demonstrate how concepts in the literature relate to um, <clears throat> to the result of your study and establish how the literature is connected. So, in a literature review, the in introduction section for an article might include a summary of the results or methods of previous studies that correspond and or confirm to those sections in your study. So, so this may highlight um, or this uh, they may mean highlighting the concepts in each article and showing how they strengthen a hypothesis or show a pattern for your thesis or, or for your study. So in your thesis, you, you need to, as we have said already, discuss the unaddressed issues of previous studies, right? And how this relates to your study. So it's important when you're doing, for example, like a concept map, like on, on, the, <clears throat> on the slide, you, you just highlight and show the interconnections with arrows, with um, broken up lines, so that when you, um, I think this is important also when you're doing, uh, for example, a paragraph edit or a sectional edit, you can see whether everything is connected and how the one paragraph speaks to the next paragraph. And that we're going to also just um, discuss further on in, in the presentation. So if you are addressing shortcomings of previous studies, it is important for you to include these studies in your literature review uh, by highlighting the study. So don't, like I said, as I said earlier, just discuss what the study looked at. You need to incorporate what you, how you're reading it, your critiques. So say this, for example, a shortcoming. For example, they use um, maybe quantitative and you're thinking no, but uh, maybe a qualitative aspect to the study might have brought out a richer kind of um, experience of maybe of participants in, in a certain area. So identify what is accurate and what is out of scope, and then also note this in how you're writing up your literature review. In addition, also identify and discuss whose works and whose theories and conclusions directly support your findings. So this is important. Also remember, we might be covering it in the in the presentation, but your theoretical framework, lots of, of, of students we see, they put down the theoretical framework section, but they don't fully understand um, what the theoretical section or um, really means within their study. So your theoretical section is actually the perspective you're coming from, the perspective from which you're going to be discussing your, your findings and um, your results and how you're going to be engaging in your discussion and conclusion section and even your results section in the way you write it up. So it's important that you give thought to the theoretical framework you're going to be um, implementing or using or employing in your study. So step number five is to identify relationships in the literature and connect them to your own ideas, as I've already started to allude to. So this is essential, essentially the same step as, as number four, but um, focused on the connections between the literature and, and your study uh, or guiding concepts or arguments of, for example, your paper and the and the and the literature you're reading. So not only the connections between between works, but also how it addresses um, the gaps in which you want to um, explore. So your hypotheses, your argument, or your guiding concept 
This is what I spoke about earlier as the golden thread that should tie your entire thesis together. So this will ultimately um, provide readers with specific insights they didn't have before reading your literature review. <clears throat> so make sure you know where to put the research question. It's important, right? So some people put the research question up front. Sometimes people put it um, at the end. So, so as you putting everything together, make sure you put every, uh, your questions at strategic places, your research question, your hypotheses, or your statement of your problem. So different um, colleges um, and different departments require them to be um, at different places. Some require them to be in your introduction section, others require them to be um, in your literature review section at the end. So, so just uh, be also aware of the conventions of your um, college. So it's important to read the resource that's been sent to you um, in, at your My Life Unisa email. It's important that you don't use your Gmail, that you're always checking your, your My Life Unisa email because that's the only email the university will use um, with correspondence. So um, make sure that you know where to place these different sections in your in your thesis so that you guide your re reader logically, also your reviewer logically and naturally from your introduction right of earlier works and evidence right up to the conclusions you want them to draw from the bigger picture. So now step six is outline your literature review structure. So there are many different structures that one could follow. And here you can see this, for example, four different kinds of structures where you can either have your literature review follow a chronological structure, a thematic structure, a methodological one, or a theoretical one, right? So <clears throat> when you start writing up, you should have a rough idea of the strategy you're going to be using or which um, structure you're going to be following. So it's important, for example, to become familiar with how people write up the literature review. So when you're reading um, articles, see what, what you think would suit your study. Make notes of how that individual, for example, wrote um, that literature events. And then also um, just familiarize yourself so that you could see what would best um, serve your thesis or your literature review section. So depending on the length of your literature review, you can combine several of these studies. For example, your overall structure might be thematic, but each theme is discussed chronologically. Um, so just make sure you, you uh, the, it follows a logical structure. So what chronological structure refers to, and this is the simplest approach, um, is to trace the development of the topic over time, right? So if you do choose the strategy, just be careful to avoid just simply listing, as we say, and summarizing sources. In, in the correct uh, you know, order. Try to analyze the patterns, for example, any turning points, for example, maybe in, in the various centuries, any key debates that occurred, for example, maybe in, in a century um, that have shaped the direction of the field. So, so make this evident as you're discussing this in your literature review. Don't take it for granted that people, people would know. And give your interpretation of how and why certain developments occurred. Right, so like I said earlier, engage with your studies. When we look at thematic, um, if you found, for example, as you read in your literature review, you found some recurring central themes, you can organize your literature review into subsections that addresses different aspects of your specific topic. So, for example, if you are reviewing a literature about inequalities in migrant health care um, or health outcomes, Key themes might include, for example, healthcare policy, language barriers, cultural attitudes, legal status, and economic access. Then also methodological. So this is multiple research methods. So if you draw your, your sources from different disciplines or fields that use a variety of research methods, you might want to compare the results and the conclusions that emerge from these uh, different approaches. So, uh, for example, look at um, 
what results have emerged maybe for example from qualitative versus quantitative research discuss how the topic has been approached by empirical versus theoretical scholarship divide the literature into for example sociological or historical and cultural so important that so it's not just as easy as we're saying it but it's it needs you to take time to read through the literature to engage to interrogate and then see what best suits your study when we look at theoretical a literature review is often the foundation for a theoretical framework so you can use it to discuss for example various theories and models or definitions of key concepts that would maybe be a foundation for your theoretical um, framework so you might argue for the relevance of a specific theoretical approach or combination of various theoretical concepts to create a framework for your research So step seven is a writing up. So now you need to start getting into the, the nitty gritty, right? And start writing up your literature review. So like any other academic text, your literature review should have an introduction, a main body and a conclusion. Always think about your writing as telling a story. You can't start the story at the end and, and not have context which which is the body or an introduction is how it all came about so it's important to, to when you're writing have this introduction the body and the conclusion so the introduction should clearly establish the focus and the purpose of the literature review so state that up front so that when your reviewer or your reader or your supervisor is reading this they already know what you intend to unpack uh, in this literature review if you are writing um, your thesis, give some background on the topic, its importance, discuss the scope of the literature review, um, for example, the time period of your sources, and also state your objective. What new insight will you draw from the literature? So just um, also, it's, as you're saying, guiding the reader, you're guiding the reader. With your body, you uh, depending on the length of your literature review, you might want to divide the, the body into uh, various subsections. So you can use subheadings uh, for each theme, for example, for each time period or methodological approach. Whatever would make it easier for the reviewer or the supervisor or the reader to know um, what you're talking about or what you're writing about. So demonstrate how concepts in the literature relate to the result of the study and establish how the literature is connected always important and that we will speak about later in how you're writing up your paragraphs so highlight the concepts in each article and show how they strengthen a hypothesis a hypothesis or a theory or an argument or show a pattern right assess how each source relates to other research within the field and then as we indicated group sources by theme or by topic or by methodol methodology and also identify unaddressed issues in previous studies which is important showing the gaps and identify what is accurate and what is out of scope with these works identify relationships um, in the literature and also connected to your own ideas on on these um, studies focus on the connections between the literature and the current study or your um, aims and objectives, right? So your hypothesis, as I said earlier, um, is the golden thread, right? It will guide the reader. So as you as you write up, you can you can follow, for example, the following tips where you um, you summarize and you synthesize, as Naima was explaining earlier. So uh, <clears throat> you give an overview of the main points of each source and you combine them into coherent help. You analyze and interpret. So you don't just paraphrase other researchers, you add your own interpretation where possible, discussing the significance of the findings in relation to the literature as a whole. And critically evaluating, right? You mention the strengths and the weaknesses of the sources. So that's important. Also, very important, you need to write in a well-structured manner, right? Your paragraphs. So use, as we're going to explain later, use transition words, use topic sentences to draw connections, and then also compare and contrast. So in conclusion, you should summarize 
the key findings you have taken from the literature and emphasize their significance. Show how your research addresses the gaps and contributes to new knowledge, or discuss how you have drawn on existing theories and methods to build a framework for your research. So now we're going into the writing process. What does academic writing look like? So important um, concepts in academic writing is you look at your audience, the tone, language, content, and perspective, and your aim. So when we speak about looking at your audience, when you're writing, right, and to write effectively, you need to identify who your readers are and to take their expectations and needs to account. So for example, if you are writing for four-year-olds, you're not going to be using academic language that's going to go over the heads that they won't be able to understand. So you're going to write at their levels. Similarly, if you're writing for, um, you're writing with thesis for academic um, uh, institutions, then you also need to target and, and write in a way that is on the level of an academic. So you need to take all these expectations and needs into account. When we speak about tone, just as your voice may project or, uh, a range of, of feelings, so to your writing can convey one or more tones. So you need to be um, aware of this, right? So for example, it could be an emotional state of enthusiasm or anger or resignation. So it might come through in your writing. So be mindful of that as you're writing, right? Tone is not an afterthought. It's an integral, um, it's integral to meaning. So it permeates your writing and it reflects your attitude towards your research as well as your readers. So readers can pick this up. Even reviewers can pick this up. When we're looking at language, academic writing uses a formal style and Typically, it uses the third person perspective, but that also depends on the type of study you're doing. So, for example, if you're doing um, a quantitative study, then a third person might might work in the way you're writing. Some now when you're using qualitative, it's more of you part of the research. You are the researcher. So sometimes individuals write from a first person perspective. With the content, the focus of the writings on facts and issues rather than the writer's opinions. The language uses precise words and do not uh, include slang words or jargons or abbreviations. So at, at certain points, abbreviations is used, but as long as, as these are these are explained up front before you start using the abbreviations. And then your aims and objectives. You need to start by clarifying what your broad aim is of the study or of the thesis. What do you want the writing piece to accomplish? So usually it, it is uh, meant to inform or explain or to convince or to persuade. So that's important. So you need to keep all this in mind when you're busy or starting to write up. And I know it's, it sounds overwhelming, but, but the, the quicker you start, the more it becomes part of your writing language and part of your process. So, um, and, and we always say, myself and, and Naima, we always tell our students that write every day, whether it's one sentence, whether it's one paragraph, make it a habit to start writing because um, then it becomes part of your, of, of, nat of your natural kind of way of writing and natural way of, of putting things together and, and formulating sentences and paragraphs. Naima, over to you. Thank you, Hawa. So um, when we look at our paragraphs and um, our internally, our paragraph internally, as well as our paragraphs within our literature review, it is helpful to think of the, these paragraphs in terms of scaffolding. So there's a particular structure that weaves our paragraphs together, but also link our paragraphs to other paragraphs and structure is, is quite important. It's an important feature of academic writing because a well structured text enables the reader to follow the argument and navigate the te text. In academic writing, a clear structure and a logical flow is imperative to a cohesive text. So most academic texts follow established structures. So there should be a logical flow across your paragraphs, but also within your paragraphs. 
And often within your literature review for your thesis or paper, um, it is good to use subheadings to create a kind of a logical structure for your entire literature review. But then within your literature review itself, within the different structure of subsections, all of those paragraphs must also flow within to each other. Next slide, please, Hawa. Next slide, please. So a paragraph is generally defined as a group of related sentences in which one single main idea is developed. And paragraphs provide structure to your writing. So every paragraph should only cover one idea, one or one aspect of an idea. So for example, if you look at um, risk factors for intimate partner violence, so you will look at the different risk factors. So you maybe look at um, and community level factors. So you cover all the community level factors and then you look at um, structural factors. So you look at, at, at um, things like poverty, unemployment and uh, etc. And or you look at the individual level factors, you look at internal mechanisms such as um, psychological, mental health issues within the person themselves or within a relationship level within the, the household, the relationship between the person and others. So you'll structure your literature review according um, to maybe a systems perspective. So you'll see there will be kind of a flow within the different subsections that you create but also within the actual subsection. So if I, for example, look at individual level fa factors and I look maybe at um, psychological factors that contribute to a person perpetrating intimate partner violence. So I look at the different aspects of uh, um, mental health issues within that kind of subsection. So a typical paragraph comprises of a topic sentence a number of support sentences and an optional concluding sentence. So the topic sentence or it is the main idea of your paragraph. It is the beginning. So a useful way of understanding paragraph structure is to think of it as a block that is divided into three sections, a beginning, a middle and an end, just like your entire literature review or your introduction has a beginning, middle, end. Every part of your thesis has a beginning, middle and end. So too, you can think of your paragraph as this block that has a beginning, middle and end. So your beginning is your topic sentence. You state one idea clearly and a useful tip is to always put the most important information first. And then your supporting sentences is your middle. It elaborates and explains the idea that you've introduced in your topic sentence and it provides evidence and examples, explain the evidence or examples that you included, included why is it relevant. And then your concluding sentence, which is the end, the last part of your paragraph, it makes the links back to the main idea of the paragraph and back to the research question, a topic of the assignment, or it links to the next paragraph. So a paragraph must be as long or as short as required to convey the main idea of that particular paragraph. Next slide please, Hoa. So to structure your paragraph, a good approach to use is what we call the PEEL approach. The PEEL approach is the P stands for making a point and then E is support the point with evidence and examples, and then explain how the evidence support the point, i.e. provide backup for the point, and then link this point to the next point in the following paragraph or back to the main point. So you link the main idea in one paragraph to the next paragraph. So um, this way of structuring your paragraphs helps you to make sure that your paragraph holds or hangs together. It has scaffolding that keeps it together quite nicely. So your paragraph starts with a topic sentence. It makes a point, provides evidence, explain and link to the next paragraph or, or first bring back to the main paragraph because the beginning sentence of your next paragraph can also link to the previous paragraph. So the next um, slide please, Hawa. Emma, can I just say also, um, students, when you when you when you're busy writing and you know everything makes logical sense, everything sounds good in your head. Once you put it down on paper, though, read and see. So what we speak about when we speak about a paragraph, edit when you when you're going back and you refine, look at your paragraph and see whether there is there a point in this paragraph, is there evidence to back up this 
point is the explanation and is there a link? Because sometimes you write and then there's absolutely no point to that paragraph. So then is it of relevance or is it adding any information to that section? So it's important to always go back and and just edit and, and look at how you're writing and what you're writing. OK, so a topic sentence in is a statement that introduces the argument where you will discuss in your paragraph. What is your paragraph about? It is the main idea around which the paragraph will be built. So the most general sentence in the paragraph is a first sentence. Every sentence in the paragraph that you have after that should be supporting that topic sentence. Right. So throughout your literature review, you will have a thesis statement. You have a topic sentence one and evidence topic sentence two, evidence topic sentence three and, and evidence and examples. So um, in order to, to make a structure for your literature review, you could before you even start writing, make a structure. What will this paragraph be about? What will my next paragraph be about? How will this link to the next paragraph? If you line out your structure, then you will insert your evidence, your 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 examples, your um, your proof of of the point that you are making, etc. Next slide, please, Hawa. So here's an example of a topic sentence. Nurses roles with inpatient care have changed significantly with the introduction of your university education. The first sentence tells you what is the paragraph about? What is the central idea that I'm trying to show you? So it tells you what to expect in the coming paragraph in the coming in this paragraph that I'm talking about. So the nurses roles with inpatient care have changed. It is changed significantly with the introduction of university education. So keywords here is introduction of university education and the change, significant change in nurses roles. So my next sentence builds on that as nurses have developed their skills and knowledge away from the workplace, worry and stress, they became more empowered and more confident in the workplace. Next slide, please, Hawa. So what should I do after I've written my topic sentence? I must make a point, provide evidence, explain and link, like I said earlier. So this is the point, the, 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 the point is the point you want to make in support of your topic sentence, the evidence you provide, and then um, your link or the summary of the thing. So sentences that don't support the topic sentence destroys the paragraph's unity. So the paragraph will not be well focused and won't help the reader understand your point. So here's the full example, right? So there's my topic sentence. Nurses role. Roles within patient care have changed significantly over time. So my point is that as nurses have developed the skills and knowledge, right? Um, you see they have developed the, the, the I'm showing the change, the significant change, right? As nurses have developed the skills and knowledge away from the workplace, worry and stress, they became more empowered and more confident in the workplace. So they've developed these skills and this allows them to contribute more to the patient's care and offer their opinions as professionals. So this is the point that you are making. And so what is the evidence for your point? This is evident in Mason's work, which found that university trained nurses consulted with doctors more often on trauma and pediatric wards than their hospital trained counterparts. Can you see it goes back to what I wanted to prove because the introduction of university education and I'm showing that nurses have a, a better say in the field of their training. In the past, nurses just did what they had to do and stood back. The doctors um, made decisions. Nowadays, when, when students go to hospitals, sometimes uh, when they do the internships, the, the, the nurses guide them through the whole process. So the nurses has more experience and have upskilled their education in terms of nursing. And then I'm explaining, right? I'm explaining in the blue. It represents a departure from the old model of hospital educated nurses who, although well trained, played a, played a relatively insignificant role in patient care. They couldn't make decisions in the past. They couldn't do things as much as they do now. Their role was relegated to the side. So now I'm providing, I'm backing up my argument again. According to Lehine, in her review of characteristics of nurses trained in hospitals rather than universities, 
Deference to authority was stressed throughout the training when compared to nurses who were educated in universities. So there's a huge leap from um, the past to the current university trained nurses. So consequently, see now my voice comes in now again. Consequently, nursing education has led to nursing profession advancement with nurses now able to speak out on behalf of patients. So however, nursing students often struggle with adjusting to other aspects of ward work because university education doesn't reflect the real nature of the work environment. Can you see how I'm concluding this? I'm critically going back to the first point, but making you understand what I'm going to discuss in my next point, what I'm talking about the struggles with adjusting to other aspects. So obviously my next paragraph would then build on that and built on that point. So next slide, please, go on. So the changing role of nurses is an impacted nurses image. Their previous role as a doctor's helper was to be disciplined, sober, humble, obedient, and never complain about their work. As Duffy et al. discovered in their meta-analysis of the subject, they are now regarded as having a more influential role in diagnosis, treatment, and prevention. So there has been a shift in the public perception of nurses since the advent of university education, where the job is now considered to be worthy of a college degree. In recent years, nurses have played a more key role in diagnosis, treatment, and prevention. Can you see how the last point is made? Nurses' role and perceptions have changed as a result of university education. Going back to the first argument, even though this is the second um, paragraph, you can see it still builds on that first paragraph. Nurses are therefore viewed as professionals, which has had a significant impact on wages and labor relations. Can you see now how the paragraph is structured and built? And if you have a subsection, you build on the first paragraph through the second paragraph and the following paragraphs. Thank you, Hawa. I'm handing over to you now. Thank you, Naima. So now we're going into um, sentence writing tips for, for writing purposes. So um, it's important when you busy writing to create an objective confident voice. Use appropriate language for your audience and purpose as we've already indicated. You need to be clear and concise because if you're going to be waffling, it's important. It's going to lose your reader or your reviewer and use language sensitively. So with academic writing, every single sentence you write must be gram grammatically complete. A grammatically uh, complete sentence consists of a complete thought and makes sense on its own, right? And it's important when you're writing, as we're saying throughout this presentation, you need to distinguish both your voice and the voices of your sources and identify each source appropriately. You need to show the reviewer and the reader that you're not just regurgitating everything that you've read, but that you're interrogating, you're engaging, and you also making your voice come through in your writing. So now establishing an, an objective and confident voice. So the third person makes writing more objective and less personal. But as I've indicated earlier, that when we're busy with qualitative work, then um, we don't want to make it less personal because we're part of the process. We're doing the interviews, we're doing the transcriptions, we're engaging with people. So um, we we want that to also come through in our um, research. For academic writing, um, the sense of objectivity allows the writer to seem less biased and therefore more credible. So with, quali with qualitative, there needs to be a balance between the credibility of your of your um, findings and the objectivity of your findings, but also of how you reflect on being part of the process. Oh, can I, can also, I maybe just come in yes. here quickly, please? Yes, ma'am. Um, so, so when we talk about using the 
I here, the third person. Remember this, the focus for, for us um, today is on the literature review. So what Dr. Ismail is just clarifying to you, in your literature review, the third person is important. You use a third person in your writing. But when you do a qualitative study, don't forget that when you do your results in discussion or your reflexivity, the I is used in that sense. But for your literature review, it's easier and it's better academically to write in the third person and to make sense of the literature in the third person. Thanks, Hawa. Thanks, Naima. So, so with your literature review, just the third person writing just helps you to stay focused on the facts and on the evidence, right? But always remember that you need to let your uh, voice come through. Okay. So here are some examples of, of how you can avoid using the personal, you know, judgment words and then restructuring. And we're obviously going to be giving you um, the, the 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 PowerPoint so you can actually see how it how it um, how you can incorporate it into your writing. So for example, um, I feel instead of saying I feel um, the study doesn't um, maybe or the study has shortcomings, you, you can say from examining the findings. Uh, I think you can say in lieu of the evidence. I believe you can say based on previous studies. So it's it's all about how you structure or how you word your um your literature review and what you've read, right? So so just um some more examples is you need to be clear about whether you are discussing something that happened in the past when you're doing your literature review or something that is having an impact upon the present. So for example you could say uh Madden's argument illustrates that or Bandura's theory supports the view that it's also all about how you're writing it. The COVID-19 pandemic had an impact upon society in a number of different ways, or the interviews were conducted with a group. Uh, so it's all how, it's not I, in, it's not about the I, right? So to so present a clear position and defend and support it, that's important. Your reader wants to see that you have a personal voice or your reviewer on the subject, and you need to, to make this clear and evident. Uh, you need to develop your position and you need to show the evidence in support. So you can't just say I disagree with the study and, and not show the gaps in how you disagree or where you disagree on, on what the, the previous study or the previous studies show. So you also may, may also present concepts or evidence that does not support your position and show why you do not consider these to be useful or appropriate. So that's what they call critique. And this in this process, you interweave voices. So you need to dis obviously clearly distinguish your voice um, from the voices of the um, the studies or the, the the authors that the studies that you've um, cited. So use suitable language for your audience and the purpose. So it is very important to use language that fits your audience and mat matches your purpose. Academic writing does not have to be complicated. Uh, but it must have an element of formality. So um, it's important, as I said earlier, that you use language that fits your audience and matches your purpose. Inappropriate language um, use can damage your credibility or undermine your argument or even alienate your audience, right? And if you have an alienated audience or reviewer, then um, it might just disadvantage teach your, your thesis um, being reviewed. So the steer clear of contradictions. So avoid don't or can't or it's or should have rather use the full word, right? Uh, do not use informal words. So avoid, for example, um, Talib 2022, Talib's 2022 word of research is okay. That's too informal. Rather say Talib's 2022 research is significant because. So it's all about how you word something, right? And remember we said you're writing for your audience in academic, so it's formal. Minimize the, the use of the words like get or got or a lot, rather replace them with obtain or obtained or many. So it's all about word usage. And I think um, some, some students, they if 
English not their first language, they refer to a, a um, language editor, but also you get online programs that can assist you with that. So make use of all the resources that are available to you. So be clear and concise. So this is important. Concise sentences and paragraphs grip your reader's attention or your reviewer's attention and help them to focus on the main point. So you don't want to be waffling because then you're going to be losing them. More concise writing will also help you organize your ideas and streamline your overall writing process. So aim for the right word on the right occasion, right? So, for example, crusade against gender based violence versus campaign against gender based violence. Which one will is more important? So make every word count. Avoid the theorist called Sigmund Freud wrote a significant piece of work called um, on narcissism, which offers valuable insights. So rather just um, um, keep it short, right? Try to use short, simple sentences. Do not clutter them with unnecessary words or details. Ask yourself what specific point or piece of information you are trying to communicate in each sentence and then remove anything that is not directly contributing to the goal. So avoid uh, vague phrases, ensure that your reader knows who or what you are referring to. So in order to make every word count, you need to get the full value of every word you write. The key is to recognize the power of a single well-chosen word and trust it to do its work. So I know as, as writers, sometimes we get very attached to the sentences and to the words we write, and sometimes we don't want to let go of these sentences, but it's important to edit and see whether these sentences or these words add value to your paragraph or to your section. So as a rule, the more economically you use language, the more powerfully you will deliver your message. So use language sensitively. So steer clear from expressing strong opinions too directly. Academic writing is concerned with presenting your discussion in an objective way. So there's no need to assert your opinion too strongly. So, for example, you don't have to say Smith has an extremely important point to make because rather just say Smith's view is, is significant because. So inclined towards caution, you, you, your use of language uh, must show that you're making suggestions which contribute to this to the wider discussion. So also try to avoid saying this view is correct because rather say it could be said that or it appears that or it seems that. Always err uh, on the side of caution. Uh, do not generalize, stereotype, or make assumptions uh, about anything. So this especially applies to individuals or groups on the basis of their gender or their race or their nationality, religion, etc. So you don't want to offend anybody um, with your writing. So now comes the editing part. So editing focus on the mechanical issues within the text, so your sentence length, your spelling, your punctuation, uh, grammatical issues, etc. So why? So you don't want a well-researched piece of writing, so for example your thesis, to be uh, detracted by grammatical errors or incoherent arguments, right? So, so you don't want your thesis, all that hard work that you've put in for a year, for example, in your master's, um, go to a reviewer to mark, and, and then there's so much grammatical errors that it detracts the reviewer from seeing the substance of your set. So ask yourself, what should I look for? So voice, who is the target audience? Is the voice appropriate to the tar target audience and purpose? Is the tone too formal or informal? No slang. Also cohesion. Do ideas in each sentence flow together? Is the clear logical flow from the ideas in one sentence to the next? Do transitions between paragraphs show a connection? And or the reason you have to put the paragraph in that specific order. So you have to signpost um, to the reader where the essay is going, right? So ensure that your manus manuscript reads well. Always a uh, paragraph order to refine your writing and achieve a well-crafted final product. 
and um, this is obviously less likely to annoy your reviewers and also allows you to improve your writing. So the more you incorporate this into your day, into your writing routine of refining and editing and checking, the more um, well written piece you will have uh, in the end. So it's important that when you're editing, you take time out. Put your writing aside for a day or two before editing, because sometimes you're so immersed in your writing that sometimes you won't see the errors or you won't see that the connections are not as concise as you'd like it to be. Read out loud. Reading in your in your head allows your brain to autocorrect some errors, right, automatically. So rather read it out loud. As we said earlier, use programs, use apps, right? For example, there's Grammarly, there's spell checks. So use all these apps at your availability to assist you in improving your writing. Phone a friend, ask a friend, right? So ask somebody to read your piece of writing because sometimes they can give you um, feedback on things that you might not be able to see. And then also, if possible, do your editing and proofreading in, in short periods of time because this will also help with concentration because sometimes don't leave everything for the last because then you're going to rush through things and you're also going to miss things. Then also shorter sentences. Avoid long convoluted sentences. Break it up for the reader. Then polishing your manuscript. Writing in a, is a two-pronged process. So revise and it and this requires time. So whatever you're writing, you're not going to also from the beginning, from the get go, write perfect sentences, write perfect chapters, write perfect sections. It needs to be revised, it needs to be edited. So every single section that you write in your thesis, give it time. About just refining and, and just um, writing, writing and, and more writing. And that's that's all from my side. Thank you. Thank you. That's all from both of us.